Okay, we're going to go into session 19 of the book of Genesis and dealing with chapters 28 through 31. Some of them are short, so it's not quite as onerous as it sounds. And of course, we're in the age of the patriarchs, this window, so to speak, or this bridge, if you will, between what we sometimes call prehistory and uh, the establishment of the, you know, the, the monarchy and so on. So uh, we've been in Isaac. We're now moving into Jacob. Uh, and uh, we're going to see four chapters. He's going to be at Bethel. And we'll see the strange things that happen there. Then we'll discover his two wives, Leah and Rachel, and the, the sons that uh, come from that, that issue from that union. And then he, t- then he takes flight. So this is, th- these are what you might call, some people call them the Laban stories. This guy Laban we're not through with. Uh, uh, he had a sister by the name of Rebecca, and so that's part of the background here. But anyway, so Jacob is on a, uh, He's with Isaac right now, and Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. Indeed he did. So Isaac is reconciled. Isaac is blessing him by faith, according to the book of Hebrews, chapters 11, verse 20. And he charged him and said to him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Interesting. Isaac does not want him to do what Esau did. He wants him to go to their own, their own people. He says, arise and go to Padan Aram. And that, that term you and I can equate roughly to what we call Syria. That's not quite accurate, but good enough for this purpose. Go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father. Bear in mind, see, Rebekah descended from Bethuel, as, as did Laban, you see. And take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. Okay? This guy Laban is a crafty character. So he, in a sense, Jacob's going to meet his match here. And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee that thou mayest be a multitude of people. And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger which God gave unto Abraham. And Isaac sent away Jacob and he went to Padan Haram unto Laban, son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. Now that's a summary statement. You got, you get, one thing you've got to get used to in the Bible, off they'll give you a summary, but then they'll continue in detail. He sent him away to Padan Aram, but he's, he's, that's a long way off. On the way, something's going to happen at Bethel that's en route. Do you follow me? You'll get confused if you assume, gee, in, in verse 5, he's now at Padan Aram. No, he's, he's undertaken that journey, which is 450 miles. But as he gets in about less than 50 miles away, he's going to have an episode on the way that we're going to talk about here shortly. Here's, the, here's a map to give you a rough idea. Haran is a long way up from Canaan. As I say, it's, a, it's north of the Syrian desert. It's in the area called Mesopotamia, which means between two rivers, by the way. And so that's a region that today we would label as Syria. When he saw, saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram, to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, and that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother, and was gone to Padan Aram. Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then, then went Esau to Ishmael, and took unto the wives which he had uh, had uh, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abram's son, the sister of Nebajoth, uh, to be his wife. You get the impression, the way this is put here, it's because this displeased Isaac that he went ahead and did it. He added another one, if you will. Anyway, Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he's, he's, he's left for Padam Aram, but he, that's a long journey. There's going to be some things happen on the way here. And he lighted upon a certain place. This place, this certain place is going to become very famous because of what happens here. He lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows. Sounds a little rough, doesn't it? And lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac, and the land wherein, whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. Here God is confirming now the covenant once again to the next of kin. He confirmed to Isaac, now he's con- con- uh, um, confirming it to Jacob. 
And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's obviously messianic. That's more than just his seed. And, and uh, anyway, and behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid, and he said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that, had, that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. And he called the name of that place the house of God. Beth, second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Bet, El, the name of God. Bet means house. Beth El is the house of God. So this is Bethel. We're going to hear about, more about Bethel in some subsequent adventures. He called them, and by the way, this is just a dream he had. But it obviously made an impression on him. And it's from this episode you get the expression Jacob's Ladder, which is a term used in, in lots of literary contexts. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and, I, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give a tenth unto thee. So this is where Jacob commits to the tithe here. And uh, the first recorded confession of Jacob, a vow and a tithe. Now, he's on his way up to Badam Ran. He's at Bethel right now. But he's going to then continue way off the chart to get to Haran. Okay? Genesis 29. We encounter these two gals. Jacob went on his journey and came unto the land of the people of the east. And he looked, and behold, a well in the field. And lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. And a great stone was upon the well's mouth. And thither were all the flocks gathered. And they rolled the stone from the well's mouth, and watered the sheep, and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in its place. Jacob said to them, My brethren, whence be ye? They said, Of Haran are we. And he said to them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. He said to them, is, is he well? And they said, He is well. And behold, Rachel his daughter cometh with the sheep. Here's another looker. We've got a lot of good-looking gals in this thing. And he said, Lo, it is yet high day, neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep, and go and feed them. They said, We cannot until all the flocks be gathered together, until they roll the stone from the well's mouth, then we water the sheep. I can't help but get the impression these people are lazy. You know, they're, they're using it as an excuse. But anyway, And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. It came to pass, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. In other words, what these guys couldn't pull off, Laban just went ahead and did. My kind of guy. I like that. And Jacob kissed Rachel. Woo, we okay. And lifted up his voice and wept. How's that for a first date, huh? Boy, lifted up his voice and wept. We're going to discover that Jacob loved Rachel more than life itself. Never wavering. Always did. Jacob told Rachel that he was her, her father's brother and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. It came to pass when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob's sister's son that he ran to meet him, embraced him, and kissed him, and brought him to his house. And he told Laban all these things. And Laban said, unto him, said to him, Surely thou art my bone and my flesh. And he abode with him the space of a month. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldst thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me, what shall thy wages be? Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. 
And you can let that sentence mean whatever you want it to mean, all right? <laughs> and Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. Laban said, It is better that I give her to thee than I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed to him but a few days for the love he had to her. Wow. And Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah his daughter and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. So you're dealing with veils here and, and so forth. But in any case, Laban gave unto his daughter Leah Zilpah his maid for a handmaid. It was customary, by the way, for the father of the bride to give the bride a handmaid if he was able to do that. That's very typically done, apparently. And it came to pass that in the morning, oh boy, it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? Jacob is going to get his first lesson in retribution. He defrauded his brother Esau. And now he's been defrauded. God is teaching Jacob the rights of the firstborn. In verse 26, Laban said, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve me with me yet seven other years. Now, I want you to notice that verse. It's not a big deal, but I want you to be sensitive to it. Fulfill her week. That's not a week of days. See, you and I, when we think of a week, we think of days. In the Jewish system, you have a week of days. We all, all know about that. We, we observe it in our Gentile calendar. Six, you, know, you have six days, then Shabbat, right? You also have a week of weeks. That's what the counting of the Omar is. That's the Feast of Shavuot is, the, is, is 49 plus, plus 1. Um, you have a week of uh, days, a week of weeks, a week of months, the seventh month. Uh, Tishri is the seventh. Uh, uh, Nisan, the start of the religious year, is the seventh month of the secular year and so forth. And you have a week of years. There's all kinds of, in Leviticus, I think it's 25, wherever, you have all these rules about the sabbatical year. Six years you plow the ground, the seventh year you let it lay fallow. It's a sabbatical year, Shabbat. And so, so you have days, weeks, months, years, uh, a week of years. And this is going to be important for you to understand because in the scripture there are occasions where the week is obviously weeks of years. Daniel chapter 9 is perhaps the pivotal one of that. You, need, you won't understand that unless you recognize that you're there. You're, Gabriel is talking to Daniel about a week of years. It's pretty obvious from the context, but I want you, this is one of the places you find this term used this way. Anyway, so he's got to work another seven years. And the scholars, uh, you know, um, um, uh, argue about this, uh, uh, the details. But anyway, and Jacob did so and fulfilled her week, and he gave him Rachel, his daughter, to wife also. So he works 14 years for two, these two brides, Leah and Rachel. And Laban gave to Rachel his daughter Bilhah, uh, his handmaid, to be her maid. In other words, Rachel, his daughter, got her handmaid Bilhah, given to her as a, a, a wedding gift, in effect. And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven other years. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction, now therefore my husband will love me. It's hard for us to fully appreciate how important issue was to the women of that day. Having children was one of their primary uh, blessings. And if they were barren, that was considered uh, a, a real curse. And uh, so she names her firstborn Reuben uh, because the Lord had seen her misery. And uh, Rehabaoni is a, is a, is, 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 speaks, of, speaks to that. And there's another wordplay joins it. Um, he also, the word... Um, Ye Ebanani is, is, is being attached. So on the one hand, the Lord has seen her affliction, and yet now the husband will love her, be attached to her. 
So both those terms in the Hebrew echo from the word Reuben, if you will. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Because the Lord hath heard uh, that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also and called his name Simeon. She conceived again and bare a son and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me because I have borne him three sons. And therefore he called his name Levi, which is uh, Yilavai, uh, which is really uh, to be attached, if you will. And uh, she conceived again and bare a son. And she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Praise, Judah, Judah, and left bearing. Judah means let him be praised. And uh, so it's interesting that Leah is evidencing tremendous faith through these four children. Um, she obviously uh, is bearing the burden of, she knows she's not loved the way Rachel is. She obviously hopes that by this issue it will be an offset to her situation. And uh, so we now get to Genesis 30, which continues this theme. When Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Even though you love the most, this, this, this older sister is born four, not one, four kids. So she said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. And Jacob's a little frustrated, obviously. Jacob's anger is kindled against Rachel and says, Am I in God's stead who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? It's obviously that he hasn't got a problem. He's got sons by the other wife. So this just tends to focus it even more. So then Rachel says, Behold my maid Bilhah, go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees that I may also have children by her. Sounds strange to us, but was common practice. We saw that continue with, with Hagar and Sarah. We also discovered uh, evidence that that was the pattern there in the area of Haran to do that. It was very uh, frequently done. And she gave him Bilhah, her handmaid, to wife, and Jacob went in unto her, and Bilhah conceived and bare Jacob a son. And Rachel said, God hath judged me, and hath also heard my voice, and hath given me a son. Therefore she called his name Dan. Dan is explained by the word Danai, which means God has vindicated me. Or some people would say that uh, he's also corrected a wrong in a sense, so that uh, her bar barrenness, if you will. So uh, uh, the, the, the term Dan also implies being judged. His name being judged. So. And Bilhah, Rachel's uh, maid, conceived again and bare Jacob a second son. Rachel said, With great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. And she called his name Naphtali which is uh, uh, having fought or wrestled, if you will. That's what the word implies. Well, Leah see, f sees this going on, saying that must be a pretty good program. And she apparently had stopped bearing, so she took Zilha, her maid, does the same thing Rachel did, gave her to Jacob, to wife. And Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a son, and Leah said, A troop cometh, <laughs> that's quite a name, and called his name Gad, which is a troop or a company or a crowd. And uh, Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare a sec Jacob a second son. Leah said, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. And so she called his name Happy, or Asher. And so that, that, that's, that, that's the first wave of these. Um, now, Reuben, he's the oldest son, went in the days of the wheat harvest. He found mandrakes in the field. Mandrakes were, were reputed to be an aphrodisiac, by the way. Uh, and he brought them to his mother Leah. And Rachel said to Leah, Give me, I pray thee, of thy son's mandrakes. A negotiation going on here. She said unto her, Is it a small matter that thou hast taken my husband? Wouldst thou take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, Therefore he, he shall lie with thee tonight for thy son's mandrakes. In other words, Rachel's apparently, they had some arrangement, but Rachel's giving her her slot, so to speak, in exchange for these mandrakes. And Jacob came out of the field in the evening, and Leah went out to meet him and said, Thou must come in unto me, for surely uh, I have hired thee with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. And God hearkened unto Leah, and she conceived and bare Jacob the fifth son. And Leah said, God hath given me my hire. The reason they went this mandrake thing is so you understand why they... See, each one of these names have a meaning. Uh, God hath given me my hire, because I have given my maiden to my husband, and she called his name Issachar. Issachar which is uh, close to the Hebrew term for, for uh, my hire. And Leah conceived again, and bare Jacob the sixth son. 
And Leah said, God hath endued me with a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. And she called his name Zebulun, which is uh, like a dowry gift or an honor, honorary present of some kind. Uh, and uh, so, so it's interesting that her hopes never leave her. And uh, so afterwards, she also bore a daughter. Her name was Dinah, which also means judgment, by the way. And we're going to see uh, some tragedies occur around uh, the issue of Dinah. But we'll move on here. God remembered Rachel in the meantime, and God hearkened to her and opened her womb. So now Rachel is going to bear directly her first child. She conceived and bare a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Yosef and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. Joseph would mean adding is, is, is the suggestion here. And uh, Now, we're going to hear a lot about Joseph. In fact, uh, a good portion of the book of Genesis is going to be the adventures of this unusual person. But we also can recognize that if you know how much uh, Jacob loved Rachel and you realize how long she's waited for a child directly, you can imagine how spoiled he was. And you get in the coat of many colors and all of that that will be coming. So the patriarchs. Let's take a look at this. There's Abraham. And of course he has, and we're talking about his wife Sarah now. We're not talking about Hagar, and who had Ishmael and so forth. I'm not talking about Keturah at this point. Uh, Sarah has a son by the name of Isaac. And Isaac marries Rebekah and has Esau and Jacob in that order. But Jacob then has two wives to begin with, Leah and Rachel. Under Leah, we have his firstborn son, Reuben, then Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Direct uh, uh, issue from Leah. About this time, Rachel gets the idea, I'll, I'll use my handmaid as a surrogate mother here. So Bilhah has Dan and Naphtali. No problem. Leah watching that, said, hey, that looks like that works. Maybe I can do the same thing. So she takes her handmaid, Zilpah, and they have Gad and Asher. Now we get around, finally, to the point that Rachel actually has a child of her own, Joseph. To look ahead, so you can get this whole perspective here, Joseph will, of course, end up down in Egypt. In Egypt, he will have a wife and two sons. And we'll get to that. In the meantime, by the way, uh, uh, Leah has Issachar and Zebulun, two more. So Leah has actually got six. Uh, Rachel will have one other child of her own, and uh, the, in which she dies. She dies in that childbirth. And, uh, that, and the, the issue was there, Benjamin, the, very, the youngest son of them all. And uh, when Joseph's down in Egypt, his wife will bear two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. A very important event occurs when Jacob is ultimately joined, the whole family is down there with Joseph when they discover he's prime minister of Egypt, and that whole incredible story we'll get to. J uh, Jacob adopts Joseph's two sons as his own, Manasseh and Ephraim. So what you really need to understand here, there really are 13 tribes. If you take Manasseh and Ephraim together, you can call it the tribe of Joseph, you have 12 tribes. If you want to leave one of these out for some purpose, you can still have 12 tribes, because you've got 13 to choose from. Do you follow me? And you're going to discover that these tribes, these tribes are listed 20 times in the Bible. Every time they're listed, they're in a different order, pretty much. And more often than not, one of them is omitted for some reason. Often the tribe of Levi is not in the list because they did not go to war and, uh, and some other reasons. This gets to be particularly provocative when you get to the book of Revelation because in Revelation 7 you've got 12 tribes listed there. One of the tribes is conspicuous in, their, in its omission. That's the tribe of Dan. There is a second tribe that's also missing, but nobody notices it. Because you have the tribe of Manasseh mentioned, and then it's also mentioned the tribe of Joseph, which obviously, if Manasseh's already counted, the only thing that's left is, is Ephraim. So Ephraim's included, but sort of in a derogatory way. It's included, but not named. Many people miss that. That all has purpose when you get to Revelation 7. That, that'll all have significance. But, but anyway, these are the 12 tribes. But it'll help you to understand that there's really 13 to choose from to get you. It's called a baker, what I call a baker's dozen. <laughs> okay? Because often you want to leave one out, but you still have 12 tribes, if you will. Okay. Something interesting. Um, 
Here are the 12 tribes with the, with the general assumption of what their names mean. This is not a precise science, of course. Reuben means looked or affliction. These, the, the, these all have, these all, what's involved here are puns and word plays, puns and also homonyms. There are two words that sound alike but mean something different. Uh, Simeon, hearing or heard. Levi, husband joined. Judah means praise. Dan, judged or judgment. Naphtali, wrestlings and prevailing over those. Gad, troop cometh. Asher, happy. Issachar, my hire or service. Uh, Zebulun, the dwelling. Joseph means adding. When Benjamin is born, uh, son of agony at first, but then changed to son of my right hand, Jacob calls him. Something kind of interesting, if you look at these in the order that they were born, they profile the history of Israel. You know, uh, the, the, the first four under Leah profile the time that Israel will be in Egypt. Moses uh, speaks in chapter 2 and 3, uh, looked on, he looked, God looked upon the affliction of his people. He heard my cry. And when was Jehovah joined Passover? That, of course, is the climax of the redemption out of Egypt. And, uh, so, and of course, then the, which, uh, upon which praise follows. The next group is in the wilderness. Remember the wilderness at Meribah, where they were judged. And the wrestlings with Amalek in Exodus 17. And then when you get to, uh, out of that, you come out of the, after the wilderness, you finally into the land under Joshua. And the nations that o o oppose Israel, they overthrown by Joshua, and they have the occupation and so forth. And uh, the last two, of course, would point to the kingdom being added to in the son of my right hand. Who would the son of my right hand be? Jesus. Okay, there you go. So it's a possibility. I mention this because you can spend a lot of time uh, looking at this. The more you look at it, the more it, it, uh, you'll, you'll see many, many other parallels. But this is, I'm just, I'm doing this not because this is some big profound proof or anything like that, nothing like that. But as you go through your scripture, you'll again and again and again see parallels. Um, uh, let, me, let, me give, let me give you another one. Um, Jacob received a blessing from his father by assuming the identity of the firstborn son. Right? So do we. So do we. We receive the blessing of our father in the identity of his firstborn son. Anyway, moving on. came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go unto mine own place and to my country. Understand, he's been there for more, about 20 years. Okay? He says, Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served thee, and let me go, for thou knowest my service which I have done thee. And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry, for I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. Laban, I, I don't think this is just uh, euphemisms there. He, Laban is acknowledging that he's been blessed that God has blessed him through Jacob. And he said, Appoint me, my, appoint me thy wages, and I will give it. He said to him, Thou knowest how I have served thee, and how thy cattle was with me. For it was little which thou hadst before I came, and it is now increased into a multitude. And the Lord hath blessed thee since my coming, and now shall I provide for mine own house also? He said, What shall I give thee? And Jacob said, Thou shalt not give me anything. If thou wilt do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep thy flock. Jacob has got a stratagem here that will sound like he will gain very little out of this. And Laban buys into this program. But, but again, we've got, I suspect Laban's met his match in connivory. He says, I'll pass through all thy flock today, removing from thence all the speckled and spotted cattle, and all the brown cattle among the sheep, and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and of such shall be my hire. So shall my righteousness answer for me in time to come, when it shall come for my hire before thy face. Every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the sheep shall be counted stolen with me. Laban said, Behold, I would, I would it might be according to thy word. Laban figures this out and thinks this is a good deal. He removed that day the he-goats <laughs> that were rain straked and spotted, and all the she-goats that were speckled and spotted, and every one that had some white in it, and all the brown among the sheep, and he gave them into the hand of his son. So he weeds the flock of those right up front. And he set three days' journey betwixt himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. 
Now understand, these aren't individual guys. They each have a whole retinue of servants. Okay, there are they're, they're employees involved here. But anyway, Jacob took him rods of green poplar and of hazel and of chestnut tree and peeled the white strakes in them and made the white appear which was in the rods. In other words, he stripped, these are uh, branches that have dark outside, but if you peel off the bark, it's white on the inside. So by peeling, you can get, it, get a, a branch that's striped, if you will. And he set the rods which he had peeled before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs, when the flocks came to drink, that they should conceive when they came to drink. And the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle, ring-straked, speckled, and spotted. Now, I am not a, a shepherd. I don't, this, when I read this, I thought, this is bizarre. This sound archaic. I was startled to discover that there are many ancient authorities that take this quite seriously. That apparently, especially sheep, when they copulate, will, will, be, will uh, often uh, render in accordance to what's on their mind when they do that. Whether that's true, which apparently some experts believe it is, and I could cite those for you if you like. Colin Dillich is perhaps the most notable commentary, critical authority on this, and, and he, he footnotes four or five references on this. Whether that really was valid or whether that was the common belief doesn't matter. Because what obviously happens is the Lord's doing anyway. But if you were like me, I was very troubled when I read this. That sounds like super, you know, silly superstition. It turns out apparently it's not. And I'll mention, by the way, just a matter of a few months ago, even in Scientific American, uh, I was startled to discover, you know, when, as they study the DNA, the master record is your DNA, and it's uh, self-replicating. It has a way of making RNA, but the RNA is edited before it's sent to the machinery that makes the proteins. They take the introns out, they, the, the machinery that snips out certain portions, they call those introns, and the rest are spliced together, and that's sent to the machinery that reads the codes, makes the protein, that makes the... You know, it ought to go. That's the whole thing. The stuff that is cut out, many of your texts call it junk DNA. The microbiologists have assumed that this, this DNA that doesn't lend itself directly to the protein building process is vestiges of ancient evolutionary. They have, they don't know. They call it the junk DNA. They don't know what it's. Well, two things. Some recent articles in Scientific American highlight the fact they're now discovering that the so called junk DNA has a very important architectural role in the human genome. But what really startled me, it, it, why are your eyes blue or brown? Your, your hereditary characteristics apparently are carried by the, the non-protein generating portions of the DNA. But what really startled me, other than all that, do you know how much of the DNA is so-called junk DNA? 96%. And when I realized that, it just blew me away because you realize what they think they know, they've learned from a very small sample of the total. And it's just like matter and energy. There's, I think, what, 95% of the mass of the universe is not seen. They're still looking for it. Um, they can know it's there mathematically from the gravitational effects, but they, it doesn't give light, so they call it dark matter. Anyway, so the point is, I suspect that what we think we know about genetics is still being unraveled. In any case, what's really going on here is, in a sense, academic for us, because whether that's just what Jacob believed, it ended up working is the point whether it worked because that's the natural process or if it's working because God chose to have it work is a moot point, really. So Jacob did separate the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the ring straight and all the brown in the flock of Laban, and he put his own flocks by themselves, and he put them not into Laban's cattle. It came to pass, whensoever the stronger cattle did conceive, that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters, that they might conceive among the rods." <laughs> And when the cattle were feeble, he put them not in, so that the feebler were Laban's and the stronger were Jacob's. And the man increased exceedingly and had much cattle and maid servants and men servants and camels and asses. So he's a very, very prosperous proprietor here. So that leads to chapter 31. And he, he heard the words of Laban's sons saying, Job, uh, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's and of that which was our father's hath he gotten all this glory. So needless to say, the, the, the heirs to the estate of Laban are getting upset. They're watching what's going on. They recognize that Jacob's winning this thing. And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not toward him as before. Okay. And the Lord said unto Jacob, Return 
unto the land of thy fathers and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. So Jacob hears from God and tells him to get out of there. Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field unto his flock, and said unto them, I see your father's countenance that is not toward me as before, but the God of my father hath been with me. Two points there. You recognize he announces to the women something. I'm sure the girls knew it long before he even recognized it. And, uh, but also that God is with him. He, he, he declares the oracle in effect. And ye, ye know that with all my power I have served your father. And your father hath deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God suffered him not to hurt me. If he, if he said thus, the speckled shall be thy wages, then all the cattle bear speckled. And if he said thus, the ring straight shall be thy hire, then bear all the ca- cattle ring straight. Thus God hath taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. And it came to pass at the time that the cattle conceived, that I lifted up mine eyes and saw in a dream, and behold, the rams which leaped upon the cattle were ring straight, speckled, and grizzled. That hints the fact that some of this idea may have been something that he got in a dream or a revelation to him. But anyway, the angel of God spake with me in a dream and said, Jacob, he said, here I am. He said, lift up now thine eyes and see all the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring straight, speckled, and grizzled, for I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou vowest a vow unto me. Now, arise, get thee out of this land, and return unto the land of thy kindred. Now, it gets a little more complicated, guys. Rachel and Leah answered and said unto him, is there yet any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? In other words, what have they got to lose? They're, they're glad to get out of there. Are we not counted of him strangers? For he hath sold us, and hath quite devoured also our money. They're upset <clears throat> because they feel they were sold out. It's not that they don't love Jacob, but they, they feel that they were treated as chattel. And, uh, and, uh, so, uh, and whatever they were entitled to is, 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 is gone to, the, to their brothers. For all the riches which God hath taken from our father, that is ours and our children's. Now then, whatsoever God hath said unto thee, do. So Jacob rose up and set his sons and his wives upon camels. He's doing this, you know, little profile. He carried away all his cattle and all his goods that he had gotten, the cattle of his getting, which he had gotten in Paddan Aram for, to go to Isaac his father in the land of Canaan. And Laban went to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the images that were her father's. These are called teraphim, and uh, they're, they're little, figure, little small figurines of deities. It's a pagan thing, and, and it shows the pagan influence in, the Laban, in, in that family. But there's something else that most people don't understand. We didn't understand until about 1930 when they discovered the tablets at Nuzi. And uh, so um, the Nuzi tablets, in about 1925, 4,000 clay tablets were discovered in a town that's substantially east of Haran, but in that region. And, this, and, and they were apparent, they're dated to about 1500 B.C., roughly the time of all this going on. Teraphim, we learned several things from these tablets. We discovered these teraphim were evidence of property ownership. Yes, they had religious significance, but their legal significance was they represented a claim to the property. And if a man died, a son bearing the teraphim could prove he owned the property because he had the teraphim. So they were a claim of property. And the inference here is, is that Rachel stole the teraphim because it was a, a way that when Laban dies that, that Jacob could have a claim on all of Laban's property. That's what's really going to be going on here as this thing unfolds. A couple other things. We, uh, uh, that's why we'll discover... When they finally settle, when Laban and, and Jacob settle, they're going to set a boundary marker because that's an offset to the teraphim thing because they will not, teraphim will be lost. He doesn't know that Rachel has stolen them. And, and Laban, I mean, uh, Jacob just buries them. But to, as an extra protection, that's why they do, a, they do a boundary marker. Something else the, the Newsy tablets reveal is the sisterhood status is often misunderstood, that a wife that was specially favored could be elevated to the re- rank of sister. That doesn't excuse what happened because that was done as a self-preservation technique, but it adds color that we need to understand to the style. Those are uh, uh, customs that were indigenous to, the, uh, to Aram and probably not known to Abimelech of the Philistines or Pharaoh of Egypt. You see? So that's, there's, a, there's a dimension to this they wouldn't be familiar with. The other thing that the Nuzi tablets uh, document 
uh, it was very common to have surrogate motherhood by the servant, the maidservants. Maidservants were often brought into service for, uh, to, to yield male heirs to the parent. And the Nuzi is about, uh, it's just, just barely uh, east of, uh, of Mesopotamia, just on the other side of the Tigris. Anyway, let's go back to the story in verse 20. Jacob stole away unawares to Laban, the Syrian, in that, in that he told him not that he fled. So this is, he is, he's trying to put some distance between him right up front. He's on his way. So he fled with all that he had. He rose up and passed over the river and set his face toward Mount Gilead. So he's moving towards what you and I would think of as the Golan Heights here. And was told Laban on the third day that Jacob was fled. It took three days for Laban to discover. So he took his brethren with him and he pursued him after seven days' journey. And they overtook him in the Mount Gilead. That's a broad region there, by the way. But anyway. And God came to Laban the Syrian in a dream. Get this now. Laban has a dream that shakes him up. God came to Laban in a dream. Laban the Syrian by night, and said unto him, Take heed that thou speak not to Jacob either good or bad. That's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting if for no other reason than when you get to the book of Numbers, you'll discover this peculiar character called Balaam. And there's some scholars that believe that Balaam was a descendant of Laban. And La uh, 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 Balaam also will not speak against Israel good or bad, in effect. There's an inter interesting linkage there. Moving on, then Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mount, and Laban with his brethren pitched in the mount of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, What hast thou done, that thou hast stolen away the unawares to me, and carried away my daughters, as captives taken with the sword? Hardly, but that's his eloquence here. Wherefore didst thou flee away secretly, and steal away from me, and didst not tell me, that I might have sent thee away with mirth, and with songs, and with tabre, and with harp? And hast not suffered me to kiss my sons and my daughters? Thou hast now done foolishly in so doing. It is in the power of my hand to do you hurt. But the God of your father spake unto me the yesternight, saying, Take heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. And now, though thou wouldest needs be gone, because thou longest after thy father's house, yet wherefore hast thou stolen my gods, my teraphim? See, you and I would read that as just a, a, you know, a pagan deity thing, and not that I'm not trying to minimize that, but there's a legal implication here that is, is, is underneath the text, so to speak. Jacob answered Laban. See, of course, Jacob had no knowledge that Rachel had pulled this off, so he's righteously indignant here. Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, and I said, Peradventure, thou wouldst take by force my, thy daughters from me. So Jacob's pretty forthright here. He doesn't trust Laban. With whomsoever thou findest thy gods, let him not live. Wow. He just, here, Jacob, in his confidence, pronounces the death penalty on whoever stole these things. With whomsoever thou findest thy gods, let him not live. Before our brethren discern thou what is thine with me, and take it to thee. For Jacob knew not that Rachel had stolen. Can you imagine how he would have felt if, he found, if and when he finds out that uh, Rachel has these things? Laban went into Jacob's tent, and into Leah's tent, and into the two maidservants' tents, but he found them not. <laughs> then went he out of Leah's tent, and entered into Rachel's tent. And Rachel had taken the images, and put them in the camel's furniture, and sat upon them. There's a camel saddle, like a saddlebag thing. And sat on them. And Laban searched all the tent, but found them not. She said to her father, Let it not displease my lord, that I cannot rise up before thee, for the custom of women is upon me. <laughs> and he searched, but found not the images. And Jacob was wroth, and chode with Laban. Jacob answered and said to Laban, What is my trespass? What is my sin that thou hast so hotly pursued after me? You should understand something else in the Torah, which comes later, in Leviticus 15.20, speaking of a woman who is in her menstrual period, says, Everything that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything that she sitteth upon shall be unclean. I think Laban would have been really unglued if he, it never dawned on him that she would be sitting on his teraphim in that condition. That's adding insult to injury in a sense, okay? But anyway, but Jacob is outraged here. He says, whereas thou hast searched all my stuff, good technical term, stuff, 
What hast thou found of all thy household stuff? Set it here before my brethren and thy brethren, that we may judge betwixt us both. This twenty years have I been with thee, thy ewes and thy she-goats have not cast their young, and the rams of thy flock have I not eaten. That which was torn of beasts I brought not unto thee, I bear the loss of it. And of my hand didst thou require it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus I was in the day, the draught consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sheep departed from mine eyes. Thus have I been twenty years in thy house. I have served thee fourteen years for thy two daughters, and six years for thy cattle, and thou hast changed my wages ten times. Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac, hath had, again, that's, a, that's a, like a synonym, the, the fear of God, the fear of the, fear of the God of Isaac, um, had been with me, surely thou hast sent me away now empty. God hath seen mine affliction and the labor of my hands, and rebuked thee yesternight. So he makes an allusion to the fact that God is all, you know, he acknowledges that God had rebuked him in that dream, see? And Laban answered and said to Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and these cattle are my cattle, and all that thou seest is mine. And what can I do this day unto these my daughters, or unto their children which they have borne? Now therefore, come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, and let it be for a witness between me and thee. And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones. They took up stones. They made a big heap. And they did eat there upon the heap. And Label, Laban called it Yeger Sahadatha, or something like that. Uh, but Jacob called it Galid. And uh, now the longer word means the heap of witness. And that's in Chaldean. And uh, the uh, other one, uh, the, uh, we're going to see another word here called mitzvah. It's, called, it's like a beacon. Laban said, This heap is a witness between me and thee this day. Therefore, it was the name of it was called Gilead. And Mitzpah said, For the Lord watch between me and thee when thou art absent one from another. Now, what's interesting here, you can go to a jewelry place, a Christian uh, shop, and you can buy what they call coin mitzvahs. They typically will make a necklace, two necklaces. They'll take a coin, they'll put Genesis 31 49 in the coin, and they'll cut the coin so it's in two pieces and put each on a chain. So you have one and I have one, and they're, they're, treat, they're treated like a fellowship thing, a coin mitzvah. It binds us together. See, the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from another. That sounds so neat. And people buy those things, and they use them that way, and that's fine. But that just shows they didn't read the text. What this, is, this, this isn't that they're buddies here. This isn't that they're going to, Lord, watch between me. What he's saying, the Lord watch you, you see. This, this whole thing is an armistice of attention. I don't trust you and you don't trust me. So here's the boundary. The Lord watch that you don't cross that boundary. That's in effect the flavor of this thing. As you read this you need to understand that the mispa is a boundary but it's a boundary of antagonism, a boundary of distrust. Jacob doesn't trust Laban and Laban doesn't trust Jacob. Jacob doesn't trust Laban for all the reasons he just outlined. Changing my wages and so forth. He feels cheated. Laban feels cheated because he's convinced somehow that they've stolen his teraphim. And this boundary, by the way, is a rebuttal to any claim from those teraphim. That's part of, what's, that's part of the dynamic. That, by the way, that's spelled out in the, in the Nutsi tablets, that where there's a dispute, the boundary will prevail. See? If thou shalt afflict, he goes on, if thou shalt afflict my daughters, or if thou shalt take other wives beside my daughters, no man is with us. See, God is witness betwixt me and thee. You know, God's watching you. God's my watchman. This is not a this is not a warm, friendly parting. This is, you know, he's good. And Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap, and behold this pillar which I have cast betwixt me and thee. This heap be a witness, and this pillar be a witness, that I will not pass over this heap to thee, and thou shalt not pass over this heap and this pillar unto me for harm. This is an agreement not to harm each other. I can see two 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 young people exchange your coin mispa. I promise not to harm you. Uh, that, that's not the way, anyway. <laughs> anyway. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, and the God of their father judge betwixt us, and Jacob swear by the fear of his father Isaac. And uh, the fear of his father Isaac, the fear of his father Isaac was the fear of God. That's a term in the English, you lose the translation, but the Hebrew implies he's, he, he swore by the God that Isaac feared, you see. Then Jacob offered sacrifice on the mount and called his brethren to eat bread, and they did eat bread and tarried all night in the mount. And early in the morning Laban rose up and kissed his sons and daughters, blessed them. Laban departed and returned 
uh, unto his place. And so, so we have been in the first of two chapters on Jacob. In the next session we'll finish Jacob, and that will leave us three sessions to explore one of the most glorious uh, things in the scripture. That's the, the, this incredible career of Joseph. And what you can do, if you want to read ahead a little bit, you can read chapters 21, 22, excuse me, session, chapters 37 through 48. There's a, about 11 chapters. Sessions 21, 22, and 23 will deal with Joseph. As you do so, take a notebook and notice as, you, as we, st- we'll notice as we study, the story, study the story of Joseph, you'll find many parallels between Joseph's career and that of Jesus. He was rejected by his brothers. He was in, and, 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 and he took a Gentile bride. He becomes, he becomes ruler of the world, virtually. Um, make a list. Start collecting a little list of how many different ways the story of Joseph parallels in some way the story of the Messiah. Arthur W. Pink lists over 100. Over 100. Now, some of them are perhaps a little bit of a stretch, but, but uh, it, it, it's, a very, very, it's a very, very incredible story made into a movie many times. Um, but it's, a, it's, got, it's, it's, it's got to be one of the most fantastic tales. But uh, we have one more with Jacob in which Jacob's going to do some very bizarre things. Jacob's going to wrestle. And who do you think he wrestles with? Well, it's a mystery, but you come to your, you read it and you come to your own conclusions. And Jacob also gets his name changed. What is his name changed to? Israel. It's interesting that all through the Bible, people's names get changed. Abraham becomes Abraham. Sarai becomes Sarah, right? Simon becomes Peter. Saul becomes Paul, right? As you go through your Bible, you'll notice that when someone's name is changed, the new name is the one normally used. Saul of Tarsus is called Paul. From that point on, it's always Paul. You don't hear him called Saul later, right? Abram isn't called Abram from that chapter on. It's always Abraham and Sarah, same thing. You're going to discover something strange about... And, and Simon Peter... Well, I'll, I'll, let me table it for a minute. Jacob is sometimes called Israel after his name is changed, a property, because his name is changed. And yet sometimes you'll find him called Jacob. What you can do as you study that, you'll discover something interesting. When Jacob is in the flesh, he's Jacob. There are occasions when he is doing it right. And he's called Israel. So you get the imp- if you study it, you can, some scholars get the impression that Israel is when he's doing it by grace and by faith and right, and Jacob's when he's this conniving, cunning, self-willed character, you know. It's interesting, all through the Bible, you hear the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel? No. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How interesting it is that there is a prerequisite condition for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that condition is for the nation Israel to repent and petition him to return. That's in Hosea 5, verse 15, and other places too. In other words, the God of Jacob needs to be recognized as the God of Israel. So it's the God of Abram, Yitzhak, and not Yaakov, but Israel. So anyway, we'll get into that next time. There's some, there's, some, there's some surprises in session 20. But it's also a good time for you to read ahead and really bone up on the chapters right up to chapters 48. That will, that, if we go to our plan, that will leave us the last session, 24th session, will be a, a session that we have only two chapters to do, 50, 49 and 50. 49 is an incredible chapter. Jacob, in his dying days, prophesies over his 12 sons with these little peculiar riddles. He lays out their future. And we'll go through that. So it's a great time to summarize the 12 tribes of Israel 
So that's why we want to leave ourselves. We, we want to crowd ourselves for chapter 49 and 50. And so and that'll be a chance where we'll, we, we'll review where we are in the whole thing. So with that, let's uh, stand for a closing word of prayer. Next session, we'll talk about him wrestling. We talk about him reconciling with Esau. That's quite a, quite a confrontation. This bizarre thing with Dinah being avenged. And then the generations of Esau and so forth. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for this record of your dealings. We do pray, Father, that you would open each of these narratives to our hearts and understanding. That we might not only understand what happened, but more importantly, understand what you have for each of us in these classic narratives. We just thank you, Father, for your word. We do pray, Father, you would increase in each of us a hunger and an appetite for your word that we each might grow in grace and the knowledge of the Son of your right hand. We do pray, Father, that you would help each of us become better stewards of the opportunities before us that would be increasingly discerning as what you would have of us in the days that remain as we commit ourselves into your hands. The God of Abram, Isaac, and Yaakov, the God of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.